Did you see my shot? I think I wrecked Ben's phone. <laughs> Say again. I think I just wrecked Ben's phone. It was an excellent hit. Did you strike the phone? <laughs> I think we it survived. It survived. Got on record. <laughs> nice smash screen. Thanks, Mimi. <laughs> All right, Kirsty, a couple more swings. Um, also, Kirsty, the one thing. Do you mind putting the strap? Does it fit? Or is one of those small ones? I may not, it may not fit now. It's one of the kids' ones. Okay, don't, don't worry. No, don't worry. Just stop. Yeah. Okay. Rotate, go back. That's it. Excellent. And come back to base. Excellent. Very good. And then uh, Mimi, let's show, show us one of those shots with which you hit your husband. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. If you hit the, the camera, I think you have, you have a, an automatic price. If you, if you hit us, the camera, automatic price. <laughs> That's very good. Very good. Excellent. Well done. Good. Fantastic. Okay. That's well, good practice on the near side forehand. We're going to go to the near side backhand. Okay. This is a little bit more tricky. So, the near side backhand, the same thing. Distribution of weight, left foot. Okay. We're going to start with the simple one, the basic one. Okay. The reins, we're going to hold the reins all the time. Okay. Same thing as in forward. We're going to lean the torso forward. I'm going to raise the arm, I'm going to raise the arm, look at the ball from, from above, and then look at the shot, launch the shot, and come back to base. Come back to base is important, so you basically kill the momentum of the stick. You don't just keep it there, it is awkward. So, leaning on the left leg, you know, uh, arm up, stick up, look, and down, and then come back. Arm up, lean over, look at the ball, feet, and then come back. Keep the eye on the ball, guys. Keep the eye on the ball all the time on this one. Like that. Excellent. Well done, Robin. That's a great shot. For a good, a good near side backhand, you don't need more than this, actually. So this opening and lifting your arm like this, going down, you have a lot more power by the way you hit the ball, you can, you can hit the ball with a lot more power than the forward hit. Because you're hitting with the, the front of your, of, your, of your hand, okay? And in this one, the grip is the same as the forward hit, okay? Exactly the same. Just pretend you want to slap the ball when you're hitting it. Just, the stick should be an extension, extension of your hand. You're going to be slapping the ball and then coming back to it, okay? And this one is also repetition, repetition, repetition. Excellent. And then you see that the weight distribution, the, the balance is getting better every time. Getting better every time. Okay. But just remember you have a course in the middle, that's why the range. And then when you come back, if you're doing things right and you're letting the, the stick follow its trajectory, you're not gonna hit the course. Okay, you just make sure that. The stick follows and goes parallel to the foot. Okay. Bernie, any points on that? Excellent. Excellent. Good. Uh, well, let's see a test. Yeah. That's it. Very good. Okay. Now, test. We're going to try to hit the ball a little bit harder. Okay. So lift your arm a little bit higher. And then have a go at the ball. That's it. You really mean to, to, to hurt the ball now. That's it. And looking at the ball every time. Just look at the ball from over. So this is where the leaning over comes, right? If you're hitting the ball too straight, you're not going to have enough power because your, your, your balance will be too centered. 
leaning over and looking at the wall, almost perpendicular up, you're going to have a massive shot. You're going to have a, a lot of power without even trying that hard, okay? So, if you can make use of the momentum, always make use of the momentum, okay? Ah, it's looking fantastic, guys. Well, let's look at Janshir. Janshir is a massive hitter. Okay, let me have a look at your near side. Your horse is turning, Janshir. So we need you to keep the left hand in the same spot. Okay? Yeah. Excellent. But you see what happens? So what happens is, once you hit, it's a bit of what happens in tennis. You hit and you go forward a little bit. That is okay. That is okay because actually when you when you when you hit the ball, you commit to the shot, you hit, and you're normally going to lean over a bit. So what happens is when you hit that shot, most often than not, your horse will turn a little bit after you hit the ball. Because you're gonna be leaning over that side. So most of your weight will be on that side. So you basically take the ball. So you want to minimize that because A, you'll be possibly crossing the line, uh, but also you want to keep that and you don't want to be too off balance of the horse, okay? This is a, actually a, a common fault in beginners. Uh, trying, committing too much, not having a, a strong enough grip on the saddle, and basically you just go over and you fall over the horse, okay? So what you want is the grip on the legs, fundamental. Commit to the shot, but also yeah, keep, keep the reins straight, and after you hit, you come back. After you hit, you come back, okay? So, our right, junction, let's try that. That's it, that's it. Excellent. Keep the eye on the ball while you hit and after you hit. Um, a little bit, of, sorry to, uh, to be in, you know, very detailed here. Just open your legs a little bit. Remember you have a horse between your legs, okay? Just open your legs and that will give you a better balance, okay? You're riding a horse, literally now. So, hand on the reins, open your, your legs a little bit, come into the shot and then come back. Okay, now let's try that. That's it, very good. Excellent. Fantastic. Beautiful. It's looking great, guys. It's looking really good. Really good. Good. Okay. So this all all this you can practice at home. You can carry on doing this. And the more you do it, the more naturally it will feel. Okay? The more the more you're you know, it's memory muscle. Uh, you know, you, you, your body remembers and you, your balance gets better and better every time. It's very important in, in, uh, the, in, at this early stage that, um, that you do keep that balance um, very, very stable because your grip on the, on the saddle, your grip on the horse is still not strong enough. So your, your sort of legs, adductor muscles and everything is, is sort of developing still. Um, and until you can be, you know, automatically, you know, really clench on the horse, you're gonna hunt, uh, you know, you have to manage that, that balance and moving around with these shots. And inevitably what happens is the ball is, I don't know, half a meter or a meter a bit farther away and you're gonna try to get it. And if you don't have a good, a good balance or a good grip on the legs, you can, you know, there is risk of, of you know, you over committing and, and falling. I mean, this is not a serious thing, but it can happen, so it's, it's, it's very important that your balance, your legs are, are, are well spread, okay? So what I'd like to do now, just briefly, is I'm gonna go through a little bit of riding technique um, in one, one, um, one of the actions, two of the actions of riding, which is the, actually the basic position and how you sit, what, what, is, what is the standard seat on the horse, and then what do you do to accelerate, and then what do you do to stop, okay? So Bernie will help me here. I'm gonna try and be loud, but um, I'll ask you if you can, if you can hear me when, when, I'm, when I'm up there, okay? Can 
anyone hear me there? Let me do a thumbs up or down. Do you guys hear me well? If, if you don't hear me well, just put off your mic and, and tell me, okay? And everyone can, can see me completely, yeah? Okay. So, the actual seat on the course when you're, when you're writing for polo is like this. You have to um, look at parallel lines, okay? What are those parallel lines? First one is a line that goes from my ankle to my knee. Okay, imagine a, a like a imaginary line there. Okay, that line has to be in parallel with the line of my back. Okay, so if I'm sitting like this, the correct position would be at the line describing my leg here. Yeah, so from to, uh, to knee is the same line that describes my back. Okay, so that's that's the correct seating. Feet facing forward, not open. Okay, this is a big difference to the equestrian riding. Feet facing forward. I'll tell you the reason for it. If you have the, you need to be as let's say secure and stable on the horse as you can be. So it's important that. Most of your of your legs, of, of the surfaces of, of your leg that can be in contact with the, the sun are in contact with the sun. If you open your feet, if you open your feet outwards, you will have a gap between the knee and the sun. You want the knee actually to be against the sun, you want your calf muscles on the side to be against the sun, you want your adductors to be against the sun. So you want to be as let's say, uh, safe, stable, and secure on the, on the, on the sun, because you're going to be moving a lot on a polo horse. So this is your safety. It's not about the hands, it's about the legs, okay? So, let's say, correct position or, or standard position for riding is the, the back slightly bent forward in the same parallel line to this line, okay? So, what happens when we go forward? So, riding for polo, what essentially is, it's a set of rules and conventions that you agree with the horse of instructions that you give the horse, okay? So, you're never going to out-strengthen the horse. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, the reins, the bit, the, the controlling, um, uh, you know, tack, apparel on the horse, is not gonna beat the horse on strength, okay? It's about the instructions that you give and how you give the instructions. Horses are trained for this, okay? So they will respond to instructions, but you have to give them in the correct way, okay? So if you're holding the reins, you normally, remember I, I will tell you every time, normally the reins have to be straight, okay? You don't want a gap in the reins uh, or you don't want the reins too tight because you're gonna be permanently forcing against the horse. You want the reins straight but not too tight. Because the instructions that you give will communicate a lot faster if you have the rain spread. So, for example, if you want to go forward, what will happen? Well, first of all, you command, your command on the range of the horse is you release that pressure on the rain. Basically, you go forward. What do you do also? The parallel. So, I go forward, I lean forward, and my heel sort of lean back as a bit so, Look at the rotation, okay? So if I rotate forward my back, my legs also almost naturally rotate. But the instruction that you're giving the horse there is, first, you release the pressure from the rein, so you go forward. I lean forward. My weight also communicates to the horse leaning forward. You know, if you're walking by yourself, when you're walking, what do you do? First, you know, you, you, your, your body weight, your torso weight goes forward, okay? So yes, you move your legs, but almost in response to your weight moving forward. Something similar happens here. So your weight moving forward also tells the horse through your legs that you want to advance. That's another instruction. And then the third instruction is with my with my legs, with my heels, I'm gonna be tapping on the horse's ribs. That's also another instruction. So first. Lean reins forward at the same time. I lean forward, my legs lean back, 
and tap on the horse is doing okay, okay? So those sets of infractions tell the horse, okay, we're gonna move forward, okay? It's a combination of reins, weight, legs communication, and actual physical tapping on the on the on the Okay. Patrick, can I just ask a question about that? You know, you tilt forward, but you—is your bottom still in the sal saddle? You're not—you're not raising yourself up. You are raising yourself up. Okay. For the purposes of the of what I'm trying to explain, that that doesn't change. Okay. But in the first instance, you will go forward. I can raise as well. Yeah. I can raise, and, and I would raise as well a little bit. But what I what, what to explain is basically that parallel lines should be should remain constant at most times, okay? But yes, to your question, yes, you can, you can stand. But you're gonna have to have a lot of power in, in your, you know, on your legs. And this is what you're developing. So one of the exercises we will do when you guys come back is a simple exercise. Uh, we will make you canter just standing on the stirrups. And you will see how difficult that is because you're gonna be looking for points of support, okay? And the points of support, normally in the beginning, will be the stirrups and the reins. That is not fully correct. What you need to get is, you're not gonna be pulling from the reins. That will be a point of reference rather than a point of support, okay? Is stirrups and legs, okay? And then your body. So, in terms of, yes, I can, I can stand and I will stand, but for now, this is the, the, the movement of forces that instructs the horse to go to go forward. Okay. Now, what happens when we are when we are country when we are when we're walking and so on? The position remains. Okay. When we are to stop a horse, okay, we need to give another set of instructions. Okay. So, first of all, the sitting we're gonna we're gonna be moving back a little bit and our legs tilt a little bit forward. Not like this, because this is actually resisting the, the, the move of the foot. What we want to do is actually to hold from the legs with points of reference on the stirrups, lean back a little bit, so that the weight back of the force is an instruction, and then pulling the reins. How do you pull the reins, okay? Now, the pulling the reins has to be not firm, constant, and increasing. I repeat, firm, constant, and increasing. No, constant and increasing, there's a contact a little bit. But what I mean to say is, you don't want to do a, let's say, sudden pull from the ranks. What you want to do is instruct the course at the right point, and then increase the, the, the force of pull towards your chest. There's another line that we need to take care of, which is the line of the reins. You want to keep the line, imaginary line of the rein, as constant as possible. So you want to go forward. When you pull the reins, you're going to pull towards your chest. Not down here, not down there. There are cases in which you are teaching a horse or, or schooling a horse that you might need to do it. But the correct way is to pull the reins towards your chest. Okay? So, the set of instructions that you give the horse coming country, you basically prepare and in the timing, remember the timing about the, you know, the, 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 the canting of the horse, when the horse is there, you start the pull, you move backwards and towards the, um, towards your chest, okay? With a little rotation like this, okay? So, this is the let's say the standard way and what you want to do is why why is this position important when you're playing polo because the riding for polo what you want to do is to let's say instruct the horse to do all these actions with the least effort possible to the rider and to the horse waste of energy got it if you're moving around a lot the horse will have to counterbalance you the horse will have to basically just understand what you need to do, and in a way the horse also looks after you, okay? The horse will, you know, most often than not, will try to counterbalance. Imagine you, you're carrying a child on your shoulders. If your child is heavy, like my boys were when they were, when they were kids, 
when they move around, you basically move around and you have to move, you know, to, just to keep them under, under your, under your, um, your shoulder, sorry, on, on top of your shoulder. A little bit of this happens with the course. The course will actually, if you move, and the heavier you are, the more you're gonna, you're gonna sort of exert that pressure of the force to, to move some way or other, intentionally or not. And what you want to do is try to keep the center of gravity at the center, and then move slightly your body weight to instruct the course what to do. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that's, sorry, if, if I'm getting a bit technical or going too fast, let me know. But what I want, the idea that I want to, for you to, to, to keep all these is position of the feet, position of the legs, position of the back at the, you know, the two, let's say, basic motives for them. Going forward, going to your position, and then when you stop, that's all you will need to do when you stop. Obviously, the pressure, the pull has to be, as I say, cost constantly increasing. You don't want to do a, a very sudden pull, or you don't want to do a, a too soft pull. You want to do an increase that pressure. And if you do it at the right time, which is timing, tap, 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 tap. Like when the horse is there, you start the pull, and in one or two stops, the horse should, the instruction that you give by sitting back, pulling your weight back, and this, you basically make the horse naturally stop with its hind legs, with the back legs. That's what we want, okay? So, again, horses are trained for this, but they are trained to receive a set of instructions. You need to give those instructions in the right way, in the right order, for the horse to respond the best. Okay, and do that in the most energy efficient manner, which is not moving around, not exerting um, the pressure or get the horse to work harder because you're moving around. Okay, what you want to do is just keep your sort of center of gravity be as nimble if you like, or, or be as um, light on the horse as you, as you can do. Does that make sense? Patrick, sorry, I'm just going to ask a question about the length of the reins. I think I, I don't think I ever hold them at the right length. Um, possible. Um, there are, but well, it depends on the horse sometimes. Some horses, you know, they, they move their head a bit more. Some horses go with the longer, the longer neck, and then when you need to pull the pressure, the distance is longer. Yeah, and that's why in many cases you will see polo players riding with two hands. So riding with the left hand normally just during the game and when they have to hit the ball, but then the rest of the time with both hands. A, to rest the left hand, but also to have that more consistent pressure. Um, if, you're not, if, you're, if your arm is not strong enough or your horse is very strong, you will end up sort of pulling like this. In, instead of pulling like this, you will end up pulling like this. And then your weight moves slightly in the wrong, in the wrong way. So, by doing this, you have more power, two hands, two arms, instead of, instead of only one, okay? But the idea is, and this is very difficult to do, guys. I mean, this, it looks very simple, uh, um, the way I explained it. But the, the, the um, let's say, the strength of your legs, the, the, the exertion on your legs is considerable, especially when you're stopping. And especially now, because you know, you're still developing the strength on, on your legs. Even Bernie and I, after a while, we haven't been riding. If you ask us to go, you know, have a go at a horse and, and try to stop the horse, we will feel the legs. We will definitely feel the legs because that is, it does require a bit of training. Um, and that, again, the stretching and the warm-up is, is very important. But there is, a, there is a common mistake, which is, like I said before, just trying to, doing this. Because this is, uh, sorry, I think, can you see me there? So, if I pull back the reins and do like this, yes, I'm probably keeping the, the, the lines, but this is not the correct way. You're pulling the, the this, this is like you're fighting the horse, on the, on the, you're pulling, you know, you, you, you basically can damage the horse's mouth. So, what you want to do is to do it a bit more gradual, firm. But up to, up to there. Okay? 
And this is very difficult because, again, the, the easy, the easy um, solution there is to really lean against your, your stirrup. And you're basically fully leaning your waist against your stirrup. Not only your weight, but also you know, the, 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 the opposite power that you're doing by pulling the reins. So the idea is that you actually withhold that pressure with your legs and a little bit with the stirrup, not fully with your stirrup. Does that make sense? Like this, and up to your, okay? Now that is hard to do guys, it, it's not easy. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the, the riding technique is, and I wanted to show you some, some videos of riding, um, that, of, of how that, and basically what you see is these guys that ride really well, you hardly see them moving on the saddle at any speed. So these guys are very nimble, very, um, let's say, they, they, they work with that center of gravity. They, 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 they are economical in moves uh, on, the, on the horse to try to be as little or, 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 or present as little pressure as possible on the, on the horse. Okay? I'm going to try this at length um, at, uh, at Colts and um, the focus on, on riding is... Um, do you have any questions on that, guys? I, I, I appreciate it's probably a lot of information, but um, does that make sense? Excellent. Good. Okay. Um, so something to think about. You know, just just bear in mind. You know, keep in mind the the parallel lines. That's an easy one to remember. Okay. Just just you know your legs and the and, and your back, and you know the sort of the hinging has to be at, at unison. And when you stop, the stop. The pulling of the reins is um, firm, gradually increasing and towards your chest. Okay? That's, that's the movement. All right? There you go. You can see Jatui there already. It's a bit like rowing, but a smaller, a smaller version of rowing. You know, in the rowing, you do a bit of both arms and, and torso back. Obviously, you have a lot more range there, no? But this is, this is similar. So you, you have double power arms. And, and torso going back, yeah? Okay. So Patrick, is, sorry. Um, so, so your hands, when you're riding normally, are they supposed to just be in this position so that you can, so that you are ready to move them each way or? Yeah, ideally what, what you want is, is your hands and, and, and the reins to be in a position where they are more economical in move to the next, the next instruction and what do I mean by this um, if my if my reins are let's say a little bit forward like this straight but I have leeway when I get the course or, or ask the course to go forward I, I will I will sort of release a little bit and, uh, and, it, and it also give, has the, the, the correct or the right length to for me to be able to do this if I'm holding the reins up here too long, so I have the Tula situation, for example, if I, if I have the range too long, I don't realize, but there is a, there is a gap, there is a gap from the, there is like a slope, yeah, like this. Mm -hmm. uh, when I pull, I have to pull back a bit, too much, and it, yeah. may not, it will not actually do what, what I need unless I pull really, really back. So you want, you want to be somewhere in, think of it like a joystick in the, you know, the old video game, that mm. you can, actually do more obviously the, the more now yeah. on the turns which we will cover next time on the turns the reins you know the double set of reins you want that to be sort of let's say halfway at the neck you don't want it to be low you don't want it to be too high you want it to be there because hey it's going to exert a little bit of pull on the on the reins and at the same time push on the opposite side of the neck where you want to go does that make sense? Yeah. If you think of, and that's a, a big difference to the way you ride equestrian, with your jumping courses. You, you ride with one and each rein. So if you want to turn one yeah. way, you just pull on that side. You want to, or, or, or it's like this. It operates like levers, yeah? This one actually is more a pulling rather than a pushing mechanism. You, you take the horse there rather than you pull the horse there. Yeah? So that, 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 
that's why you want the range to be to be straight. If you are too long, what ends up happening is you, you have to transport your hand too far left or too far right for the range to take effect on the opposite side of the neck. Yeah? So you want the range. It is a bit of a science, yeah, and, and I grant you that. And it depends on the horses. Sometimes the horses, you know, they, they move the head a bit longer and, and they pull the reins and you end up with the reins too long. It happens all the time. That's why you always, in a way, you have to keep track of that, of that length of, of reins um, much at all times. Yeah? Because the, it, you're going to be riding with one hand most of the time. Okay? So the ball goes somewhere. If you have to accommodate, adjust the reins, when the ball changes direction, it takes you one or two seconds. You, the, 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 the play carried on. You, you, you know, you wasted time. So you need to be ready, and you need to be basically execute or the horse to execute that order um, as quickly, as effectively, and efficiently as, as possible. Yeah. And remember, yeah. one one concept to remember here is we don't physically ride the horse or with power we give horse the horse instruction the horse does everything so when we stop the horse we do not stop the horse the horse stops following our instruction and that's that's mm -hmm. the slight subtlety about this you know you're not going to outpower the horse even if you're very strong mm -hmm. you know how much stronger a horse is than a human roughly an estimate is about 15 times stronger than you 15 times 15 18 times it's a lot more, you cannot out strengthen a horse. Yeah. So you need to, the instructions, and the horse is trained for it, eh? okay. Uh, you need to really give the instructions the right way for the horse to perform. So Bernie will tell you many examples of people that basically cannot ride such a horses, and some other player can. Why? Mm. Why is that? Because, well, obviously, experience and so on, but these guys give the right instructions, they, they prepare the horse better, they get the horse ready for the next move. They communicate with the legs um, uh, much better. That's, it, it, it comes naturally, you might, you might want to say. Um, but we need to get you there in a way that you can communicate and you know, connect and communicate with your horse um, the best. So the, the three concepts that are taught in, in this course we just did, we just did with Bernie and Memo is um, connected, coordinated, communicated with the horse mm -hmm. they all three they all have you know a, a specific meaning why why do you need to be connected why do you need to be communicating why do you need to be um in sync with the horse because the horse has to understand you prepare the horse for the next move you communicate correctly um so the legs in this is fundamental you ride with your legs more than with your with your legs yeah? mm -hmm. sorry i've got another question yeah. So, so that, so, so the height of the hand. I mean, I guess if you are just riding, would you be riding with a kind of a soft mouth? If you're just using your sort of your body for communication, like your legs and things, and you're just riding, and I guess you'd be riding with a soft mouth, so you wouldn't be sort of maneuvering the horse too much um, until you gave it a, a clear communication that you wanted to go backwards and forwards or sideways or. So does it matter what height your hand is? Does that, does that have a sort of a, a change in the bit or the communication to the, I guess to have it too high? How does, how does that affect, I guess that also affects your balance. So yeah. okay. where, where, where would that be in the mid? There are many layers to that, to that, to that question. Um, so yeah. I'm gonna start the very basic, which is imagine you know, you're riding a horse and the only thing you do is just instruct by the reins. So you go in this direction, you're cantering or galloping and, and you just want to ride by the reins. Yes, the horse will obey that instruction in a way. But imagine another scenario where I'm basically just a, 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 you know, a player is, is riding the horse and basically position the legs in the, in the, in the right way his weight, his legs, and then instruct with the legs before even touching the reins. Mm. The, and gets the horse on the right lead first, which you can do with your legs, uh, and so on. That move, that next turn, is going to be much more effective, efficient, fast, than 
and the, uh, than, 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 the, than the first one, okay? And yes, the position of the rain is very important because if you have the, the range, you know, too high, that will probably be, be, be too long. Um, it will take longer to, for, that, for that to respond. Maybe, you know, if you are in the, in the camping and then you move the rain, maybe the instruction arrives because of the length of your, of your, of your rain you know, one stroke later or half a stroke later, which, which means the horse would be, you know, stepping on the ground, which takes another, um, you know, stroke to, to, to move. So it's all, it's all, it's, it's a combination of things now, but very important, the timing and the, the fast or the speed at which you, 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 you can give that horse the instruction or the speed at which the horse can receive the instruction after you gave it. So that, it, it is important. Most players uh, of a certain level, they would actually ride more with the, with, with the legs than, than with the reins. So the horse can, and I can show you videos of people um, schooling horses with no bit at all. Okay. One guy riding a horse with the legs. And if you've seen the, the, the rodeo in the US where you have these, these uh, quarter mile horses doing the splitting of the, uh, you know, of the cattle, you see that the reins are completely loose. The guys are giving instructions purely with the legs. Yeah? So the, the, the reins, the beat and so on, it is an element in you riding the horse, not the only one. Um, but when you, when, you, when you start riding, when you're learning, that's your, basically your steering wheel. Um, not realizing that you have other elements to, to control the horse, which are very, very uh, okay. yeah? Thanks. Patrick, one quick question. When you are in your position, when you are uh, uh, riding, uh, you lean forward when you want the, fo the horse to move ahead. But what is your normal position going to be? Is it going to be completely straight back or a bit forward still? What would be the ideal position? So, I can demonstrate. Hang on. I'm stationary now. Stationary. My my torso is slightly leaning forward. I go forward, and then I fall into my my stable. It's gonna be slightly leaning forward. Always respecting that. This is. It will feel unnatural when you when you can. You're gonna be feel, feeling a little bit. You may be bumping a little. So you want just a little bit of this. Will give you just that little extra flexibility uh, and ability to ride. It's actually even more comfortable if you try it. You know, if you sit back compared to this, it, it, it's going to be a more natural. And actually, it's, it's your sense, if you look at, let's say, your length from back to front here, if I'm sitting like this, my center of gravity is behind. Whereas if I'm here, my center of gravity is like basically, if you, if you draw a line through my whole body from top to bottom, it's going to be more or less halfway from here to here, if that makes sense. So that's, that's what you want to do. You know, just, you know, keep the center of gravity as center, sideways, forward, backwards, as you can, okay? All right, that, thank you. Does that make sense? Yep, it's good, thank you. Very good. Bernie, anything? I know you're, you're, it's late for you. don't want to put too much pressure on you, but uh, any, any thoughts? I think it's, uh, you're, on, you're on mute. No, sorry. I didn't, I didn't say anything because it's, uh, you're just saying exactly what we, we went over this morning. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's just, just spot on. Nothing, nothing to add. Um, can I have a question? Sorry. Yep. Um, you know, you're saying the legs are really important, um, but also there's what I've realised difference between like normal riding and polo. You have to be a lot more flexible in the saddle. You know, you're not riding upright all the time. Where are you mainly gripping? Is it your sort of upper abductors have to be gripping all the time? Because your legs are moving all the time as well, so you can lean and tip forward but you're still kind of gripping at the same time so it's your that you, you're still kind of gripping back but moving at the same time uh, first of all uh polo riding is normal riding eh? you're referring to polo as abnormal eh? 
um, the uh, so obviously this is the this is the you're not going to be in that position all the time because you're going to be moving you're going to be riding off you're going to be extending to reach a ball so but that's where you want to go back to and that's where you want to that's so what you want to that's the ideal um, position when you want to um, make a move you know go forward go stop then we'll go about the the, the side uh, moves you know turning next time but that's 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 where you want to be ideal but if you see photos of people playing polo they are all over the place you know trying to reach a ball up there up here they also just hit the ball and they are completely off of course you can't be like that all the time um, but that's where you want to go back to when you're playing tennis you know you're gonna be like Need to know this very well. You're gonna be there all the time. Hit the ball and then, and then, and then same thing. Okay. So you want to you want to be ready for the next move in the best position you can be, and and also more importantly to be get be able to instruct the horse in the best way. Okay. So that's and that's that's how it's proven to be. I mean, this is this is generations of, of riding for polo. And what is the most uh, the, the efficient way? And as I say. The, the, the least pressure, the least energy you, you, you make, you get the horse to, to waste, the better. That, that is the idea. But being, let's say, ready to go, you know, prepared, communicate with the legs. If you're just sitting, relaxed, not pressing with the legs, the horse will just go relaxed, pull it, you know, head down. And, and actually, it won't be ready for the next move. It happens. Um, you know, even here, sometimes, when, when we tell you guys, you know, get the horse alert. That's the reason why. But you can you can do that not just with the reins. You, you have to do it, you know, with your whole body. Okay, you, you, you communicate with the horse, particularly with the legs, but your body weight, uh, you know, your reins. You get you get the horse ready for the next move um, completely with your whole body. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay. What else? Um, okay, on, on this, I, I don't want to go into into other moves because we can spend a fair bit of time uh, to talk about those. But again, just just if I can if I can leave you with these ideas um, and concepts for when you come back riding, uh, these are the things that we'll you know, we'll focus on. Yeah, so we'll 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 come back to we'll we'll reiterate to get you to the next level of riding. Yeah, um, and. Back to the beginning, you know, when, when we when we get you to ride in, in sheepskins, there is there is method to it because we need you to build your legs. Build your legs that then are very important in this stage. Um, so as I said, if you try, for example, to canter standing on the stirrups, you will probably fall forward right now because you're not you're probably not going to be gripping strong enough with your knees, with your calf muscles, with your adductors. Um, and I will challenge you to this. We will challenge you to this when you, when you come back. So it's an exercise that you will see. And if you fall forward, then that gives you the proof that you, know, you still need to strengthen your, um, your legs, okay? That, that's why, Pato, it's, uh, the trotting is so important. Um, it's, it's, it's like ABC. You, you need to be able to trot bareback like, like we do at Colts. And uh, then when you move forward, it just, things just are natural, you know. And about this trotting, um, about standing at a, at a, at a canter, we, I don't remember if I did it with some of, some of the group, some of the people from, from the groups in the mornings. Uh, but most of them have done trot uh, standing, and um, and most of them actually stayed on st stayed stayed pretty good. Um, but it's it's like you say, it's like it's nothing actually. Having stirrups is nothing. If you don't know how to use them, you might as well not even have them. So it's good that they actually start paying attention at them now. No, and it is. I mean, the stirrups. Again, this is a conceptual change. It's, it's not the. It's a point of reference. It's a. It's a point of support, but it's not the only one. Um, in fact, if you rely purely on foot, um, then you're not going to have a good grip because you know, it's the only. The only. The only support you have is going to be from your pressure downwards, not sideways. You know, and when you're playing polo and turning, yeah. and so, you're going to. You know, inertia goes everywhere. 
you're gonna you're gonna you're not gonna be able to just do with the with, with standing on the on the stair. Yeah. Okay. And it 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 it's also good for them to to feel this this same thing that you're saying now because it's gonna happen someday that they're gonna be playing and the stirrup can can cut or it could break and you got to feel safe even if you don't have them that's why it's so important to know how to ride properly yeah exactly exactly okay well i think i think we can we can leave it as that um on 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 this um and we won't have time to go through the the the, the rules part but i think this was this is important um obviously unfortunately yet we cannot do it uh, um um riding but you will I, i'd like you to just keep that in your in your mind when we start riding again and this and this will be will be uh will be coming back um and we'll talk to you about that okay so what i'd like to do next is um is go through the to the quiz which um tula has very kindly sponsored and i will let tula talk to us about the the price amazing price i'm going to put it on screen if i can um can everyone see that okay so tula would you like to tell us what uh, what this is uh, yes, um, one of the things I do, I design and import um, Indian cotton canther quilts from Jaipur in India and um, I sell them at fairs and online. There's a website as well called malabarandco.net and they are hand block printed and they come in four different colours and three different patterns. So the lucky winner today is going to win a king size canther quilt which is worth $290. And if you just let me know, the winner lets me know, they can choose the style and color at the end. Fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna get, um, move on to the, to the quiz then. Um, Tula, did you get, you, you got the questions, yeah? All right, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do some questions each. So, um, as before, we're gonna have a set of, actually 11 questions in round one. And the you know the first can go to if we need to go to a second round. There's five more questions, uh, and if we still have a tie, I have a thin this question to just break every tie there is. Okay, so we'll start with the. This is a combination of questions on polo and also on related to to Jaipur and India that uh, that Tula put together. Okay, so I'm going to kick off with one um, rules question. Okay. We went through this one before, so you should all get it right. So, first question is, what happens if a defending player hits the ball, then the ball hits an attacking player's horse, and the ball goes out of bounds to the back line? Is it A, it is a safety hit or corner hit from the 60 yards? B, it is a hit in from the back line for the defending team? Or C, it is a throw in from the point it hit the horse's leg? Okay. Did everyone get that? I'll move on, yeah? Can you repeat, sorry? Yeah, so, so what happens if I'm a defending player, hit the ball, hit someone else's legs, so my uh, opponent's legs, and the ball goes out of bounds on the, on the back line, on my defending line? Is it a corner shot, safety shot from 60 yards for the attacking team? Is it a hit in from the back line for the defending team? Or is it a throw in from the point where the ball hit the horse's leg? Okay, question number two, may I ask Tula to, uh, to ask please? Okay, I'm going to read out the following statement and you've got to tell Patrick whether you think it's true or false. The city of Jaipur in Rajasthan is known as the pink city. Is the following statement true or false? It was during the time of Maharaja Ram, Ram Singh of Jaipur in 1876, he painted the whole city pink to welcome their guest, which was the Prince of Wales and Queen Victoria, when they visited India on a tour. And since pink denotes the colour of hospitality, so the city was painted pink. True or false? Excellent. Okay, next question. Tommy Lee Jones, US actor and also a polo player, 
once said that playing polo felt like playing hockey in an earthquake. Is that true or is that false? Okay, next question. Which, which of these statements is incorrect? Talking about a throw-in. A, players or of, of opposing teams face each other and are allowed to hit the ball once the ball is thrown in by the umpire. B, only in the number four player, which usually sits at the back of the throw-in, is allowed to hit the ball during a full swing. C, players cannot write off an opponent until the ball is thrown in by the umpire. So one of those three statements is wrong. You want me to repeat them or okay? Okay. Question number five, Tula. Shh. Sorry, children everywhere. Um, elephant polo was a popular sport in Rajasthan before it was banned on cruelty grounds in 2008. In which country did the sport first originate? Was it A, Thailand, B, Nepal, or C, China? Elephant Polo origins, Thailand, Nepal, or China? Uh, do you want to do the next one, Tula? Okay. Question number six. Polo was established in India as a recognized sport by two British army officers in what year? Was it A, 1930, B, 1815, or C, 1860? Okay, next question. The function of a martingale, it's a piece of tag as everyone knows, is to A, keep the horse's head up, B, maintain the girth safe and tight, is it C, keep the horse's head down? Martingale, to keep the horse head up. B, to maintain the girth safe and tight. Or C, to keep the horse's head down. Bernie is smirking there. Bernie, you're not allowed to participate in this one. Eh? <laughs> okay, so question number eight. If you're watching Polo, a polo match in the Rajasthan Polo Club in Jaipur. Which of these statements would be true? A, only the captain of each team may address the umpire. B, the number one player in each team is also referred to as the scratch. Or C, more than 50% of the grooms looking after the horses are women. Rajasthan Polo Club, A, only the captain can address the, uh, the umpire. B, the number one is also called a scratch. C, more than 50% of the grooms are female, women. Okay, next question. In the Potrillo's Cup, which is the sub 14 year old biggest cup in Argentina, the way to break a tie if the game ends up in a draw is A, the whole of the back line becomes a goal line and the first team to pass the ball through that line scores a goal and therefore wins. B, there is a toying cost by the umpire to decide who, which team wins. Or C, the team receiving the loudest cheers from the crowd, and this is measured by a sound level meter, wins the game. Anything is possible here. <laughs> Can you just repeat that, please? Because the, it was breaking up. Sure. So in the, this famous sub-14 year old cup in Argentina, if there is a draw at the end of a game, it's decided by A, the whole of the back line becomes a goal and the team that scores through that line scores and then wins the goal, the, the, uh, the game. B, there's a, there's a coin toss by the umpire. Or C, the team that received the loudest cheers from the crowd, and they measure this by sound level meter, wins the game. Okay. Question number 10. I remember I played that, that, I played that cup and uh, we, we came to a tie and uh, we, 
we had to to see who won because of that. Yeah. But I remember. <laughs> okay. So Bernie, what happened? <laughs> I can't remember. I'm too old already. <laughs> All right, question number 10 and 11. I'll ask you two now if you can do. Okay, we're back to Jaipur again. In 2011, a British comedy drama was filmed in Jaipur and it was one of the highest grossing films in the UK, New Zealand and Australia. What flower was the film named after? Was it A, a frangipani, B, a rose or C, a marigold? Okay, is that all good? Everyone got that? Okay, and next question. Okay, still part of the same film question. Who was the famous actress who starred in that film? Was it A, Helen Mirren, B, Judi Dench, or C, Julia Roberts? Very good. Okay, so that's the that's is any question you want to repeat before we go to um, counting the uh, the scores. Okay, I think everything is clear. So okay, let's go through the answers then. Um, so I'll go uh, to I'll go I'll do the ones that um, I asked, and then you do yours. Okay. So for oh, my one. What happens when the player, a defending player, hits, hits the ball? The correct answer is answer B. It is a hitting from the back line. Okay? Let's check whether you got that right. Question number two, Tula, you want to give the answer to that? Uh, you're, you're on mute, uh, Tula. Sorry, it's true. The city was painted pink by the Maharaja because of the Queen visiting. The whole city, that's amazing. Fantastic. Okay. So the next question, question number three about Tommy Lee Jones saying that playing polo is like playing hockey during an earthquake. That statement is actually false. Not the statement. It was another actor that actually said that, uh, made that statement. It was Sylvester Stallone. So a bit of a trick right there. So the statement is correct, but it was Sylvester Stallone who said it back in the 90s. He tried playing polo. Okay, question number four. The one about the throw-in. Which statement is incorrect? The statement that is incorrect is statement B. It says that only the number four player is allowed to hit a ball with a full swing. Nobody is allowed to hit the, a full swing in the throw-in. Okay, so B is the correct answer. Tula, question number five. Yeah, question number five. The answer is B, elephant polo originated in Nepal. B. Okay, and then the next one um, also, uh, Tula. The answer is C. Polo is, was established as a recognized sport in 1860 by two British officers. 1860. Excellent. Good. All right, so the next question, the function of the martingale. What is it, to keep the horse up, the head up, maintain the girls safe and tight, or keep the horses head down? Bernie, can you answer that question correctly, please? Yes. To keep the horse's head down. <laughs> Excellent. You were sweating for a minute there, Bernie, yeah? <laughs> I was. <laughs> okay, question number eight. What happens, uh, uh, which statement is correct if you're watching a polo match at the Rajasthan Polo Club? The correct answer is answer B. In India, you can also, they, they call the number one player a scratch, as in golf, but it's not for the handicap, it's for the number one. Okay. Question number nine. The Potrillos Cup. How do you break the tie? 
Which one do you think it is? <laughs> All three are plausible here. The correct one is actually the whole of the back line becomes the goal. So if they are about to finish, the, the, the time gets extended and whoever scores through the whole back line scores the goal. Is that what happened, uh, Bernie, in your, in your game? Did you, did you win or lose? Yes, we won, we won. And, um, and the name of, of, of that, of that uh, situation is called arcoiris. So it means- um, Rainbow. Co uh, rainbow. So it's called rainbow goal. So from wherever you score, it goes through the back, you win. There you have. I like the cheering one, yeah? That, that would be fun. It's we won we won that we won that game and then we, we lost the following game. I, I remember. I still remember today. I don't forget those things. <laughs> Excellent. So questions nine sorry, ten and eleven. Um, Tula, do you want to answer? Yes. Um the 2011 film, it was named after the sea, the Marigold. The name of the film was the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. So it's C. Marigold. Should I go on to 11, Patrick? Yes, please. And the famous actress that starred in that film was B. Judy Dench. <laughs> so I think Chris got that one right. Chris, you look very happy. No? <laughs> okay. Okay, so the answers for the 11, 11 questions of round one. Okay, I'll start um, for the first one on the screen. Balu, how many did you get correct? Eight. How many? Eight. 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 Okay. Robin? Six. Emma? Uh, eight. Oh, Emma, always a contender, eh? Uh, yeah. Not allowed. Uh, Jed Hui? Eight. Six. Eight again. Oh, that's my Eight. Top. Good, good, good. Victoria? Also eight. Also eight. A very busy second half. Um, Mimi. Eight. Very busy second round. Marcus. Contes. Nine. Nine. Oh, we may have a winner. Eh? Okay. Uh Kirsty, how many did you get? Uh, you're on mute. How many? Seven. Seven. Chris? Six, unfortunately. Six. Oh, there we go. Get ready, Marcus and Tess. Meeting? Seven. Seven. Uh, oh, Grace just dropped off. So we had also Grace. She must have... Uh, Okay. Okay. So we have a winner on round one. That is Marcus and Tess. Well done, guys. You got the uh, you got the quilt. So I think he's sleeping very, you know, smooth and uh, and, and warm next time. Um, you want to do the next five just for, just for the consolation prize? If you have time, I appreciate it. we're over. If you guys have to go, we have five more questions. If you like to go through them. If Patrick, I got to run. Okay, yeah. All right, now I think I've, yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jed Hui. Um, everyone else, do you want to stay for another five quick questions or we, we close it? Victoria, Emma. Um, okay, let's do, let's do the next five. Um, let's do five quickly. Okay, I'll start very quickly. Um, question one. In a polo match, there are two umpires on the field and a third man watching from the stands. Which statement is correct? The third man can indicate to the umpires via walkie-talkie where there is a foul committed. B, the third man is only consulted when there is disagreement between the two umpires. 
See, all three individuals must wear similar umpire shirt, generally black and white. Okay. Next one. Can a player, a polo player, hit the ball with his or her elbow and score a ball, a goal? A, it is always allowed. B, it is never allowed. C, it depends on his intention. Okay? With the, with the elbow, hand of God scenario. Yeah? The British uh, remember this, the English remember this very well. Um, question three. Actually, Tula, you want to do this one? Okay. Um, Jaipur is home to one of the most expensive hotel suites in the world at the Raj Palace Hotel. How much would one night set you back? A, 40,000 US dollars, B, 70,000 US dollars, or C, 50,000 US dollars per night? You want to do the next one, Tula? I think this is one of yours as well. Yeah, okay. Back to the block printing. Which wood is traditionally used in block printing? Is it A, teak, B, cherry, or C, mango wood? Okay, and the last one. Last question is, under USPA rules, United States Polo Association rules, it is not allowed to play with a mallet without a strap. Is this true or is it false? Okay, uh, let's go through the answers quickly. So, first question about the, the, um, the umpires and the third man. The correct answer is answer B. The, man, the third man is only consultant when there is disagreement between the two umpires. You cannot indicate a foul before or as it happens. No. Question number two. Can a player hit the ball with his or her elbow and score a goal? The correct answer is C. It actually depends on the intention. If, it, if it's hit unintentionally and then it scores, it can, it can, it, it's allowed. But if it's on purpose, no player is allowed to hit the ball with anything intentionally other than his of her mallet, okay? Question three and four, Tula. Hey, the answer, the most expensive, that um, it will cost you 50,000 US dollars to spend a night at the Raj Palace, which is C. And question number four, the wood used in block printing traditionally is A, teak. We go, and then last question and the USPA rules. In fact, under any any rules, um, uh, you are allowed to, to to play without a strap. Obviously, it's advisable to wear a strap so you don't drop the stick, but you can you can play without without a strap. Okay, all right. Let's see how many. This is for the just for bragging rights. Yeah? There's no more prizes. Um, question: uh, Just how many did you get right, uh, Balu? All questions right for Baloo. Four. Three. One. How do you get them? Give me a moment. How many questions? Only three. Three. Okay. Just wait on. Uh, Victoria. Three for Victoria. Three. Uh, Mimi. Two. Two. Uh, Marcus, you can win this one again, Marcus. <laughs> oh, that's three plus three. Six. That can, that's not possible. <laughs> okay. Three. Kirsty. Kirsty three also. Chris. Oh, knitting. Actually, knitting comes first. How many? Three for knitting. Oh. 
And Chris, how many? I'm so sorry. I didn't do that round. I, I, I had, to, I, I wasn't, I'm sorry. Yeah. You have to buy a, a round of drinks when we reopen. Okay. That's the, that's the punishment. Yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, do, I'll do a prize one week. Yeah. Okay. So Balu and Robin, I have a decided question for you. Um, let's see if you, um, uh, so you guys are, on four each. Okay, so the decided question is this. There's a breed of horse called the Marwari horse. It's a rare breed of horse originated in the Marwar area of Jodhpur in the region of Rajasthan. Which of the following statements about the breed is incorrect? Which of these four statements is incorrect? Is it A, the breed is considered as the national breed of India? Is it B? The Marwari horse has an unusual feature. It has inward curving shape in the ears. C. It is found in all typical equine colors. Or D. The British cavalry valued the Marwari horse as a sturdy workhorse, and herds of the Marwari horses grew during British colonial times. Okay? So A. The British considered national breed of India. B. It has an unusual feature, the inward curving shape of the ears. C, it is found in all typical equine colors. Or D, it, it was a very valued horse by the British cavalry and the herds of the Marwari horses grew during British colonial times. So, Balu and Robin, for the bragging rights of the week for round two. How many did you get that right? Oh, sorry, which answer is the, is the correct answer? B. E. Inward facing ears. And Robin? I thought the same, uh, kind of randomly. I thought that sounded like a good one. <laughs> B as in the inward uh, ears? Yes, inward ears. Okay. That statement is actually correct. So the horses yeah. do have a feature. Just Google it. Um, I've seen them. There are horses that have the ears a bit like inward It is considered a national breed in India. Uh, and it actually comes in all colors. So they, they have colors. Uh, so the, the, the wrong answer is about the British cavalry actually did not like the horse at all. And, and in fact, they, um, they oh. prefer the thoroughbreds or the polo ponies. So the herds of the Marwari horse actually declined during British colonial times. Okay. Mm. So a bit of culture there. None of you won. Uh, sorry, uh, but you both won this, uh, <laughs> the second round. Um, and I'll come up with a tricky one also next time, yeah? Okay, so that's that from, from me, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, for um, Tula, for the sponsorship of the fantastic quilt. Um, so, uh, Marcus, I'll put you in touch with, uh, with Tula to uh, get hold of your prize. Okay. Excellent. Uh, just one very little one. I know everyone wants to ask this question. Um, what is happening? When are we opening? So there's, there's, there's meant to be a, an announcement this weekend about um, how the, the phase two confirmation of the dates. There are two dates given. Now they call it phase 2A and phase 2B. So there's going to be a week apart. Um, I think it's 22nd, so a week, about 10 days from now. Um, for phase 2A, and we should, for whatever read, we should fall in this category, and then 2B is a week later on the 29th, okay? So um, just stay tuned for the announcements. Um, we are in communication with N Parks, the authority that deals with us, um, So, but we, we don't have yet a firm date or format. As soon as I um, sort of have contingency plans of how we're going to open if it's limited by numbers, by age, ages, um, you know, safety protocols and so on. So um, we need to abide strictly by those and probably even more. So, um, so yeah, that's where we are. Um, still hoping, but at, at least there are some dates in the, in the horizon. Um, and, uh, you know, we're hoping to, to, to open very soon. Okay. Any, any last thoughts or questions? Are you home, Bernardo? Or one yeah. more day? 
Jimmy, come again. Did you get home yet? Are you home yet? You're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute, Bunny. I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting to take off the the mute. Yeah, I'm home already, so uh, I'm I'm taking it uh, easy. And uh, well, I never take it easy. I'm lying there. Um, <laughs> nah, I'm just I'm just happy to be back with the family, with uh, wife, son, just uh, loving it. So tomorrow, tomorrow I've got actually the first day out actually um, that we are allowed allowed to to go out like we we we're going like 85 days of of quarantine or something like that and apparently they're going to extend it so people are going wild here but tomorrow i'm going out so i'm just going to enjoy a little bit with them it's gonna be it's gonna be nice what was what was the reaction of hilario your son when you when you saw him he just looked at me like he he didn't really understand anything what was going on at the beginning he he was like shocked like this and then uh, after a while he started talking to me and then every two seconds he was saying hola papa <laughs> like <laughs> he didn't really understand it and uh, and now 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 he's he's okay with it now he he gets he gets a point he was trying to figure out i think why i was like a few hours ago on on the phone screen and then suddenly I was with him so you know the rest is uh it, it's cool but he's he's so he's so big like I, I left like for five months I was gonna go originally like for three months and then I stayed like two months and a half extra and 